me in Luke chapter number six. Thank you, guys and gals of our praise team for just a weekly, every week, bringing a, a message of worship and praise through your voices, through your instruments, and for us to join in together. That's a sweet time of our first day of the week celebration. This is the first day of the week. We'll get into that a little bit today. We're going to be talking, uh, obviously, about what Jesus Christ is teaching us out of Luke's gospel. We've made it through the first five chapters. We're in Luke chapter number six. We're going to cover the first 11 verses. Uh, we'll read 12 because it's a good one. It'll lead into next week's message uh, when it speaks of Jesus Christ, of course, going off to pray before he calls and chooses his 12 to uh, do the work that he's called them uh, to do. Consider this, they've been following him, he's been inviting them, and there has been followers, there have been disciples, but we now have the depth of Luke's gospel in chapter 6 of the, the call of those that are chosen to fulfill as apostles of the Lord. What an incredible honor, what an incredible uh, place of scripture here. And beyond these verses today, just to give you a kind of a look into the future, he then, of course, instructs his disciples as apostles and begins to break into the things that they need to grab hold of as he is looking into his second year of ministry, um, Make Hope Known. One of the pieces and parts of Make Hope Known, and I mentioned it last week, and, and so I've got to do it one more Sunday to remind you of something, and that's that... Um, make hope known through some of the things that we do collectively and as a, as a group, as a church-wide thing is really, really important, our regional mission stuff. We do have Trunk or Treat coming up again. Uh, a reminder this Sunday, I mentioned it last Sunday. Um, did everybody grab my email again? You are right, Angie. Where's the time? It's from 11 to 2 p.m. this coming Saturday. Click on the button that is in that email and say, hey, I'd like to do a trunk and, and uh, fill it up with some candy, decorate it, and pass out some tracks to, to children and their families and tell them about Christ and have an interaction with them. We've invited, of course, all our people through ADP Sports and in our community, but uh, it's an opportunity for you to jump in. And so if you got that email, uh, if it's in your junk, as I said before, uh, different times, Please take me out of your junk email and, uh, and decide that I'm not junk any longer and that uh, that email from Pastor Mark, we can read that and again, you'll see there's two buttons on there, engage the mission. You can again do a trunk, you can be part of our greeters, uh, you can also be part of our security and parking and uh, of course the biggest thing is to be part of our concessions. We're going to cook some hot dogs and give them away and uh, uh, popcorn and things like that. So uh, make sure that you uh, jump in on our opportunity to uh, make one more last touch before the, the year is out uh, collectively and, and together wise. I know we got Christmas season coming up and we've got something special in that time, but trunk or treat, we haven't done it in I think five years. And so I'd love to have you be part of it. I know a lot of uh, different organizations, schools, churches, a lot of people do trunk or treat, and we just want to, again, touch the people in our community one last time and let people know about Jesus Christ. Of course, as it says up on that screen with make hope known, the verse that's the theme of our study, for the Son of Man came, uh, excuse me, has come to seek and to save that which is lost, and we need to be reminded of that. Last week, we looked at nothing old, just new. We finished up chapter number five, and, and uh, now, just look up at the screen there. Jesus came to give us the new. And this was a slide I had up last week, and this part of our introduction, just a reminder. We're not to hang on to the old. Some people say, well, there's good memories back there. Yes, to remember what God has done is always tremendous. It's always good to look back and say, remember when God did this, and the benchmark of this, and the landmark of this, and, and thank you, God. We'd like to do that. We'll do that in November and December around here and say, Thank you, God, and praise him for all that he's done. But when it comes to our personal old religious stuff, maybe our old way of life, we're to say goodbye. What good is the message of a new life in him if 
it is conflicted with the old life. The Pharisees, they love religion. The scribes, they love uh, uh, religion. They, they love the things and the stuff that are on the outward. Now, the outward should be a result of the inward. There should be clear-cut, defined purposes in our lives as believers that show people, that model to people that we're saved, we're born again. Jesus Christ is going to be up against some people that are watching him. If you look at verse 2 real quick in chapter 6 before we get there, but certain of the Pharisees said unto them. So the Pharisees are going to speak at Jesus and the disciples. You say, well, didn't they have an interactive conversation? Well, it gets there, but usually they're speaking at him. If you go down to verse number 8, it says that they're watching him. The Pharisees and the scribes and the religious people watch things, and they call things out. Or they ask questions, or they'll say, uh, they spoke to Jesus, and they spoke to the disciples, what are you doing? And not for a good reason. Because for you and me, as a new creature in Christ, a born-again life, we are going to be watched now and then. It's when those that watch you or speak to you are doing it in a condemning or a condescending way to see if they can trip you up. That's what they wanted to do with Jesus. And so just looking at that simple slide, it goes to a couple of verses that we had at the end of our message. Verse number 36, and he spake also a parable unto them, and it speaks of the new and the old. No man putteth the old wine. A piece of garment, excuse me, I'll get ahead of myself. A piece of garment, a new garment with the old. If otherwise, when you do that, what happens? They both get ruined. Then both the new maketh a rent, another tear, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. Then, of course, the wineskins, verse number 37 and 8. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. That new wine represents, and wine references the blood of Christ. It also represents the new spirit, the new joy that's in you from your salvation. Putting it into the old bottle means, hey, you can have all this new stuff in the Bible, all these new rules and regulations, and sure, that'll be great, and you could, all this new stuff. Well, the new life in Christ there's something neat about when you call on the name of the Lord to save you, and is that he makes you a new vessel. He puts you in a place where you are baptized in Christ, and you're raised in his resurrection, and now, hey, there's a new vessel. There's a new person from the inside out. New wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. The Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians about having this ability to understand things when you're born again. You have this mind of Christ. You have the ability to discern between foolishness and wisdom. When you're lost, you don't. That's that old wineskin. That's that old garment that when Jesus saves you, you're born again, and you're not to hold on to the old you're supposed to grab hold of the new because you are a new garment with a new, completely new life. You see, new garments and new wineskins mean a new life, a new purpose, new focus, new heart, new love, new thinking, and a completely new message for people to hear. But the Pharisees had an old message, a constant old message. And they're gonna, we're going to go at the Sabbath part of their, uh, their law-abiding stuff, and they're going to hold on. What what is it about this Sabbath law that they need to hold on to? Well, the Pharisees saw it as a thing where, hey, if we just keep enough Sabbaths, if we keep the Sabbath properly, then Jesus is going to come. He's right before you. You don't have to do some ritual or some tradition or some set of things, and that will then usher in. It's going to be God's way that he's going to do it. And he's sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, right before your eyes, religious people, Jewish people. So again, let me reference that Sabbath thing. In start of Luke 6, Jesus Christ, as the Son of Man, taught about the Sabbath day. And what he meant when he said, in verse number 5, that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. That blew them away right there. That upset them and bothered them. 
so much so as we're going to see that they, after they see him, of course, heal in the synagogue, they get so angry they, again, want to take his life. Jesus is, again, as I mentioned earlier, I'll say it once again, he's in the beginning of his second year of ministry. And he is bringing up something that they are bringing to him. The religious people are saying, hey, what is it about the Sabbath day that you're messing up? Jesus is going to reference something in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel about David going to Ahimelech after he has gotten away from King Saul. And it says that he's on a servant's duty, which in a way is... As some would say, well, that's a complete lie. Well, he's on a duty. He's there to serve. He's there to carry out something. And Ahimelech is, of course, scared of David. He knows of his reputation. Most of all, he knows that Saul wants to kill him. And so Jesus uses a reference to David in 1 Samuel about keeping the Sabbath and what it means with the bread. And and we'll get into that in a little bit. Jesus also, of course, when he talks about healing here in the Sabbath time, he's saying, look, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. If you had sheep as Pharisees and and, and they were lost, you'd go get them, wouldn't you? Well, you're telling me that I would not and cannot and ought not on the Sabbath to heal somebody? And he speaks of, would you have me to do evil to people and not do good to them? You see, the conflict in the Pharisee, the conflict in the religious person that holds on to rituals, that holds on to the letter of the law instead of the intent of the law can be very dangerous. What is your Sabbath that you hold on to? Is the Sabbath okay to celebrate? Fine. If you're doing it in a biblical way, but if you are allowing a Sabbath ritual, a traditional thing of your life, become the Lord of your life, now you're displacing the Lord of the Sabbath. And you and I know how easily we can put some of the things that really have a biblical basis, but yet they really have nothing to do with our walk in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a quote from Wearsby. I've used a two or three of those from him. By their strict and oppressive rules, the Pharisees and scribes had turned the Sabbath day into a burden instead of the blessing God meant it to be. And Jesus challenged both their doctrine and their authority. Their strict and oppressive rules Put burdens on people. We'll end our message with a verse, passage of scripture that you, many of you may be familiar with. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, Jesus Christ says. And to me today, I want you to really grasp in just these 11 verses how this interaction with the Pharisees is another reminder of how many things we hold on to that are in a religious place of life, that are in the way of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Religious people who challenge the grace and truth of Jesus simply because of their self-righteousness must be taught. That's what Jesus is doing. They must be schooled. No religion, just Jesus. That's the tagline of Brian Clark. Anybody ever been to London on a mission trip? Yes. You guys wore those red T-shirts. You talk about walking the streets of London in a T-shirt that says, no religion, just Jesus. That'll get the attention of some people. To stir up a conversation. To say, can we have a coffee? May I talk to you about what religion can do to condemn you? Because you're condemned already. This morning, when you think of our text, again, just a few verses. I only have two lesson points. I'm going to teach a little bit about the Sabbath and the first day and their contrast. And just really grab a hold of the Sabbath things that we hold on to that get in the way of 
Jesus being the Lord of our lives, the Lord of the Sabbath. Thus, the simple title is always Schooled on the Sabbath. This is what Jesus is doing for the Pharisees and scribes today. Schooled. (laughs) He's schooling them to be schooled on the Sabbath. Let's be schooled on our personal Sabbaths. Again, not taking anything away. If you said, hey, the seventh day of my week, I rest and do nothing. Well, I doubt that you do nothing. Maybe you're probably eating barbecue all day. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. But it might be a good principle for your life. But Jesus is saying, Pharisees, you're holding on to something that's between me and you that's more important than you directly coming to me and allowing me to be the Lord of your life. Verse number one, chapter number six, and it came to pass. On the second Sabbath after the first, that he went through the cornfields. And his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. They'd taken that, that, uh, that piece of wheat and they're rubbing off the outer part to get the kernels, the, the nourishment of the wheat. They rub that off. They get that. Of course, remember the whole principle in the Old Testament of the gleanings that come in the harvest. And you start thinking about Old Testament principle and leaving that in the corners of the field for those that are going to be able to be nourished. So there's a picture there, principle, verse number two. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? You think this is going to trip up Jesus, verse number three. And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this, what David did when himself was not hungered, and they which were with him, how he went into the house of God, and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone? Remember who David is. He's a progenitor of Jesus Christ. He is the king that really pictures who Jesus is going to be to Israel. And as we know in our study, Jesus oftentimes uses scripture that the Pharisees are supposed to know to prove his point. Verse number five, and he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Verse six down through 11. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. What's the right hand for? To reach out for fellowship, to greet people. There's so much more to that we won't get into. But here's this right hand that he can't extend. It's withered. The scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. And he knew their thoughts. So they're watching him in verse 7. I know I said verse 8 earlier. Verse 7, they're watching him. Verse 2, they were speaking to him. They're speaking at and speaking to and trying to call out Jesus and his disciples. And now they're watching him and what he's going to do. Some say this is some kind of setup. Well, the truth of the matter is the people that wanted healing went to the temple area. And they've heard that Jesus Christ would heal anybody. He has not neglected or rejected anybody to be healed. It even says later on in this chapter, as we grab the disciples and see what's going on, that Jesus Christ... He, he, there was a great multitude of people and he healed them all. <laughs> Jesus didn't reject any of them. So they're watching him. Is he going to heal this man with a withered hand on the Sabbath in the synagogue? What does he do in verse 8? He knew the thoughts. He said to the man which had the withered hand, rise up, stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Verse 9. Then said Jesus... Unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness commune one with another what they might do to Jesus. And I'll read verse 12, which isn't up there. And it came to pass in those days that he went out 
into the mountain to pray. And it says there in that verse 12, he continued all night in prayer to God. Here's your preview for the introduction next week. It says in verse 13, he called and he chose 12. There's three C's right there, Bobby. That would be a good message right there. Just use some C's. He continued, he called, and he chose. That's the setting we have here, because I said earlier, he's about to get into really teaching, really training these ones that he's called and chosen. But up to this point, it's his first year of ministry. Galilee, he spent a lot of time in Galilee. We know that he was in Cana of Galilee for his first miracle. We know that he spent a lot of time in Capernaum. He has received well there. People of Jerusalem, ha, <laughs> ha. They're not so happy with him there. Nazareth, we know. Ah! He's rejected there even from his brethren. The setting is very, very clear to us. Jesus Christ is about to school them on the Sabbath. Can you be? Will you be? Are you open to being schooled today by the Holy Spirit? May the Holy Spirit school you today on your Sabbath. You mean the seventh day of the week? No, I'm talking about the religious thing that you hold on to. Or the second religious thing, or the third religious thing. Or the thing that you hold on to is a, ri ri a ritual, a piece that puts something between you and the Lord. Because truly, Jesus Christ is going to put something before these guys when it comes to their worship of something that, of course, is very, very important that God instituted. But that they're holding on to. To trip up Jesus, to push Jesus away, to justify their existence of rejecting him, and even to the point where they'll partner up with Herodians and anyone, lawyers, in order to threaten Jesus Christ to take his life. Schooled on the Sabbath. I want you, before we get into a couple things, consider this. Again in this chapter, we will find out how the Beatitudes to a different audience are put before. Jesus will then talk about the woes that are before the people. He will talk about how you're to love your enemies. He will talk about judgment and not to judge. Uh, he will talk about a testimony of how a tree is known by its fruit. This chapter is filled. By the way, Luke's account is incredible in terms of its gospel writing because he'll just put together a bunch of stuff in a chapter and you go, is that all chronologically fitting with everything? No, if you looked at the synopsis of these three Gospels, you can kind of line things up a little bit. John's Gospel brings in, of course, as we mentioned, different pieces. But here you're lying in a spot, in a place where this really is, in Luke's Gospel, pretty much one of the last times that he really gets into the Pharisees. Are they around and are they mentioned? Yes, the lawyers are mentioned. The publicans are mentioned. The scribes are mentioned. But the interaction, this is one of the last times until near the end of his life that they again show up, of course, and Luke's accounting is there. So here he is schooling them on the Sabbath. What do you know about the Sabbath? Let me give you a little background. What was the Sabbath and its meaning to Israel? It was the seventh day. It was one of sanctity. They set it apart. It was supposed to be a place where it was a holy day. God gifted it to Israel at Sinai. If you went back to Exodus chapter number 20 real quick, you don't have to, but if you, you didn't, you say, okay, Exodus chapter number 20, is it in there? Well, God put it before them to say, hey, look, I'm going to show you some stuff. Verse number 8, chapter 20, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Six days shalt thou work, or labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Again, imagine what he said in verse number five. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. He just declared himself God before them. It says in verse number 10 and continues, In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy man, maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the seven sea and all that was in there, rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Hey, great thing to hold on to. It's in the Bible. It's a sign between God and the nation of Israel. You say, what about everything that's going on in the Middle East? 
You don't want to have me talk about it. That's not the Israel that's in the Bible. I'll just say that to you. Things have changed an awful lot in a few thousand years. Keep that in mind, please, when you're looking at stuff. There's an awful lot of stuff that's happened with this nation. They have rejected Jesus Christ. They have said no to God. God wrote them a bill of divorcement. I know that they're God's chosen people. I got that. But you and I have to look at what Jesus Christ is teaching right here in his first coming. And somehow, some way, it's forgotten that this sign between God and the nation, God gifted it to Israel at Sinai, that he set things apart, it means to rest, that God sees from his creation. Don't forget real quick as we go into the next part, the first day, go there real quick. The next slide, it says there, what was the Lord's day like? God rested after his work was finished. Jesus Christ, where is he at? His work is finished. So the first day is now treated the way it ought to be treated. In Acts chapter number 20, it talks about it being this first day is one of sanctity. This is the first day of the week. The last day of the week was a time of resting from a long, laborious, difficult, hard week. This is the first day of the week getting you ready to walk in Jesus off to the mission field to advance the mission. That's why we gather. Oh, I don't know about that. I think that Sunday's become, unfortunately, not our first day of the week to recognize the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Believers, let's wake up to this. Church, let's wake up to this. This is a rallying point, a rallying place. It speaks of rest from the finished work of Jesus Christ. His work is finished. You and I are called out as his bride. We are his church, and we are to gather. And then from this gathering, we are to go out to the highways and the byways. We are to go out and advance the mission. It says in Acts chapter number 20, verse number 7, upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. That's a pretty long preaching message. What do you think? I'm going to preach till midnight today. No way. I know you'd be all leaving. We have some other things to do, but consider this whole setting. They departed, go to Macedonia. They've gone and traveled a bit. And it says in verse number five, these going before tarried for us at Troas. We sailed away from Philippi after the days of living bread and came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. And so that's what we did. We got together as the church on the first day of the week to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. First Corinthians chapter number 16, verse number two says very simply that we're to gather in the first day of the week. Uh, you guys are familiar, many of you are, the, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by, in, in store, by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Well, that's because you're supposed to come to church and dump all your money in the pocket. I think that's not what it is. It's simply saying the collection of the saints, for I have given order. This order is to get together in the first day of the week so that we can commemorate Christ's resurrection. Well, this is just a nice ritual for me. Oh, forgive us, Father, for where we've ended up. I hope this message is good today. It's almost over, isn't it? See, Paul addressed all this stuff in Romans 14 and 15. He talked about it in Galatians 4. Are you there yet, Doc? Galatians 4. He talked about keeping any holy days, any special days that had nothing to do with your salvation. You see, the Word of God is very clear that this Sabbath stuff can get in the way of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, you can write these down as fast as you can, but these slides won't be up here long. You can look them up. They're all in your Bible. Sabbath controversies. Here's three of them on the first slide. The disciples plucked ears of grain in Galilee. You see this in the first five verses. Jesus healed a paralytic at the pool of Siloam. Jesus healed a man with a withered hand in Capernaum. That's right here. So two of the three right there in the first three, boom, they're right there. 
Now, let me move on to the next slide for you that are taking notes. Scramble real fast, take pictures. The second slide shows two more. Jesus referred to the Jews circumcising on the Sabbath. That's in John 7. Jesus healed a man born blind in Jerusalem, John 9. There are Sabbath controversies in the walk and the ministry of Jesus Christ. They are clearly here. And you and I, in thinking of that little, that little text or note earlier that was a quote from Wearsby that, hey, the Pharisees were holding on to things and, and making the believers walk more of a burden than a blessing. Well, these Sabbath controversies, Jesus Christ clears the room. Jesus healed a woman bent over in Judea, Luke chapter number 13. If you were to go there, which we will in a few weeks, we'll be able to teach through that. Jesus healed a man with dropsy in Perea. That's coming in Luke 14. You see, this is a little bit of background on the Sabbath, a little bit of background on the first day of the week, a little bit of background for you and me to realize that this is something in this time that's really, really huge to them. It's really big. So what is big to you today? Is this a holy day of obligation for you? And if you don't come, you know that you're going to lose out on God's favor and possibly, you know, it'll be a bad work on your resume for salvation? No. Is you giving money to the church something that you're holding on to as a religious thing that I've got to do, an obligatory thing, holding to the letter of the law. When God says he loves a cheerful giver. You see the word of God and what it has for us and what we're supposed to follow after falls in line with the divine nature of holy God, Son Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit. In his great trinity, he shows us that when he teaches us and schools us on a matter, we have to check ourselves and say, what is it from the religious teachings of our, ba of our, of our old days, of our many, many years, that put us in a place right here where the Pharisees are? Generation after generation after generation after generation of saying, hey, Jesus, you're messing up the Sabbath. There's something wrong with you. Jesus, you can't heal somebody. There's something wrong with you. Let's look at two things in the next few minutes. That's all I got. After I just want to set this up with a little bit of Sabbath, a little bit of teaching. The first one, boy, you're fast today on the finger. Way to go. Schooled on the Sabbath. First five verses. Jesus confronts the religious law keepers. He teaches them. He confronts them. Off of verse 2, which speaks of them speaking to him. You will learn the scriptures correctly when the old law is viewed properly. It is our schoolmaster that was fulfilled by the Son of Man for the glory of God. Galatians chapter number 3. When are you preaching this one, Doc? Well, for all those that went to investors, close your ears. I'll be repeating myself. I'm just going to quote the scriptures. I'm just, I'm just going to quote the scripture. That's all I'm going to do. Galatians 3. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ that we might be justified by faith. I like that. That's right on the money. But after the faith has come, that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, Romans chapter number 6, have put on Christ, Ephesians chapter number 4, Colossians chapter number 3, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ. Then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Bam. So he's schooling the law keepers. He's saying, look, if you put the old law in proper perspective, if you understand correctly and you view it, pro view it properly, 
then you will stop holding on to it as a determining factor of whether or not someone believes in Jesus Christ or not. It should be the result of. Well, you're not a good enough Christian because you don't keep enough laws. <gasps> what are the Sabbath rules in your life and Sabbath rules and rituals and traditions that are in your life that are in the way of this passage of Scripture that we love so much. Let me throw this out at you. I read about the schoolmaster. I read the Scriptures of the book of Galatians. I, I read about this. And I think, I, I'm thinking, that I really love that a lot. But how often do we get that good teaching, the good preaching, the Jesus stuff? Jesus is saying, look, I am the son, I'm the, the son of man, I am the one who is the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm telling you right now, stop what you're doing. But the Pharisees, <laughs> they would take things out of context. They would add to things. They'll condemn people, condemn Jesus Christ. And so you read that passage of Scripture and say, yes, that's good truth, good truth, good truth, good Bible teaching. Thank you, Doc, for teaching that. Thank you for getting excited about it. Thank you, God. And then one, two weeks later, all of a sudden, I've got this pharisaical religious way of creeping back into me instead of getting closer to Jesus Christ for these last two weeks so that I know that my life will be in him. It's not a matter of you and I just changing things in our lives behaviorally when we head into a certain setting of people. These Pharisees were good at it. The legalists are good at it. And Jesus Christ leveled the playing field. It says in Matthew's account in chapter number 12, But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. What's he referring to? The next slide that's up there, 1 Samuel chapter number 21. If you had known this and understood the text, you would understand what's going on with David here. And you are seeing him reference that. You say, well, some would say that was a big old lie on David's part. That's a big old failure. So Jesus is basically just condoning lie and falling apart. No, 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 no. Understand what the Pharisees are always after and understand Jesus Christ bringing the truth with grace. They are all over completely to the letter of the law. God is about the intent of his law. And it says there in verse number one, then came David to Nob to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David. I mentioned this earlier, said unto him, Why art thou alone, no man with thee? And David said unto Ahimelech, The king hath commanded me a business and hath said unto me. Well, we know he's run from him, but the king has business for him. Well, who's the king? I'll just leave it alone. Let no man know anything of the business whereabout, whereabout I send thee and what I have commanded thee. And I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now therefore, what is under thy hand? Give me five loaves of bread in thy hand, or what there is present. What's happening here, very simply, is Jesus is drawing an analogy. And the Pharisees obviously know this analogy. And what's Jesus saying? Your ceremonial traditions are secondary. Your way of seeing how the ceremony is carried out, and how the bread is handled, and how you... See, the Sabbath and its rules and all that should be held to be more important than God and where he is at. Divine service is most important to God. Our relationship with God and what we are about in the Father's business is more important to him. David did something that in the Pharisees' understanding was completely contrary to the Mosaic law. In Leviticus 24, it tells us of who can partake. Yet, Scripture doesn't condemn him for it. Jesus' disciples, they didn't do anything that was contrary to the Mosaic law. And the Pharisees had no right to condemn them. But yet they did so. And they were finding a way of going about it when it tied together to the Sabbath, which again has a whole lot more to do with 
the letter of a law that I can find where I trip you up versus the intent of the law for divine glory of God. David was there to meet a need. David was there to meet a human need. And God allowed it. You say, wow, that's an awful lot of grace on God's behalf. You better believe it is. As you know the story of David and how it unfolds. Come on now. He is such a picture of Jesus Christ. Absent, of course, from his failures. Mark chapter number 2, verse number 27. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Grasp that for a minute. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Jesus Christ did not violate the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is not a violate of anything. God is greater than all the laws that he ever imposed. God made them all, but he's greater than them all. Have you forgotten the intent of his law? It's to always reveal his glory. To draw men. To have them point to him. But we want to point to us. Even in the Old Testament they did it. We do it as bad today. And Jesus is dealing with it. He said, look, Pharisee, what's your Sabbath issue? Because we say, well, it's just the Sabbath, and I don't have anything to do with the Sabbath because I'm born again and I go to church on Sundays. Whoa, what's your Sabbath place? What's your Sabbath ritual? I've asked you that three or four times today. That's our major thing to deal with. And the second piece, the other half of the chapter is this. I mean, other, chap- other half of our scripture today, verses 6 through 11, schooled on the Sabbath. Jesus then showed... He, of course, confronted them. He taught those law-abiding citizens of the Pharisees. Now he's going to show the religious caregivers. You will live the new covenant deeply. Just, Just follow this. When your wicked thoughts are searched repentantly. Thoughts. It says in verse number eight, he knew their thoughts. It's our thoughts. It's our thoughts, and then they move into our hearts. I know the heart's the issue. I got that, but our thoughts, we just go, oh, we can just think what we want. You see, it is our great conviction in the salvation of Jesus Christ to do good to people, not evil. We need to live here a little more. Consider the setting that Jesus has these Pharisees who are all about doing good things for people, yet he is doing something good for people and they're saying you're doing wrong. It's all about the letter of the law, not the intent. And I'm not saying, oh gosh, his heart was right in the matter even though he sinned 42 times. I'm not talking there. I'm talking about David was meeting a human need, and we see how that was taken care of. And he didn't violate with condemnation. His violation, God permitted. Well, here we have a setting where Jesus Christ is healing someone with a withered hand, and it's on the Sabbath. Well, you're supposed to do evil to people and reject his healing. Don't do anything for him. What does this say that they do? (laughs) They have an accusation against him in verse 7. It says in verse number 10, looking round about upon them, he said unto the man, stretch forth thy hand. So he does that. And it says in verse number 11, after the healing, they were filled with madness and communed one with another that they might do to Jesus. Look up on the screen, Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. That's Matthew's synoptic look at the same passage, I mean the same accounting. So you go, wait a minute. It says in verse number 11, they were filled with madness and communed one another. In Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 14, it says the Pharisees went out, held a council against him, how they might destroy him. (laughs) They communed one with another, they held counsel. It says in Mark's account right there, look at verse number six. The Herod, they went after the Herodians, the self righteous rejecting of even the Jewish faith to align themselves with Herod so they would not get in trouble with Herod. These are the Jews. We're so faithful to Israel, but when Herod came across with anything, what did they do? They changed their allegiance because they're Herodians. The Herodians were Jews that tied themselves together to what Herod wanted. The Pharisees went forth. 
straightway took counsel with the Herodians against them how they might destroy him. They wanted to destroy him. The Pharisees constantly want to take blessings away from this man being healed. They want to put burdens upon you in your life. They want to put burdens around Jesus Christ. They want to shackle his life. And he says, "Uh uh-uh, you're not doing it. Galatians 5.1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Be not entangled with the yoke of bondage. What is our pharisaical Sabbath place that we live in where we watch someone else do something that's against what we see as the law and instead of giving them grace and mercy, we seek to destroy them, hurt them, Talk to another brother or sister about. Time out, everybody. We all have our places of Sabbath ritual that gets in the way of Jesus Christ healing a man with a withered hand. It says there in verse 8 he knew their heart, uh, knew their thoughts. And we know the heart is deceitful. Desperately wicked. We know the thoughts and the intents. We know out of the abundance of our heart the mouth speaks. But with these thoughts right here, these thoughts. And he said to the man which had the withered hand, knowing the thoughts of this group of people that were watching every move he made, rise up. Rise up. Just like that lame man. I forgive you of your sins, stand up. Do you and I look to bring burdens on others? Absolutely not. We would never do that. Not in Jesus. Here's Matthew 11. The Pharisees are big about bringing burdens. Their yoke is burdensome. You can't fulfill what they want from you. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my yoke, my yoke. Jesus is speaking. Learn of me. You can't just say the verse and not go. It's like reading Galatians 3 and we're all in Christ. You got to go live there. You got to go get more of that. You got to swim in the pool of Jesus' incredible grace, incredible love, incredible truth, incredible love, incredible grace, incredible truth. He is the one that has a yoke that gives you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The pharisaical way of living life is a yoke that is cumbersome, that is burdensome, It has nothing to do with, oh, you're saying you could just do it. You get close to Jesus. You go after his yoke and you lock in with that. You can handle anything. Because his burden is light. And his yoke is easy. And everybody in here has gone through some awful stuff. Some tough stuff. We're about to have a memorial service this afternoon for the father of a young lady that's a member of our church who tragically left this earth two Saturdays ago. How did that happen, man? The Pharisee, what did you do wrong to be blind? Oh, God, forgive us. You mustn't have gone to church enough. What we have learned from our master teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, (laughs) what have we learned about religious rituals? So here's your question for invitation. What are you battling with from the teaching of religious leaders that restrain Jesus' words from teaching you? Oftentimes we just... Jesus is teaching the good stuff. He teaches the best stuff. If you're wondering where you should wander around here, Bible reading, and you haven't read something somewhere somehow, grab a gospel and start reading what Jesus did, how Jesus lived, how Jesus talked, 
how Jesus cared, how Jesus healed, how Jesus gave glory and honor to his Father, how Jesus prayed, how Jesus taught, how Jesus taught us how to do relationship well. Would you please stand for a word of prayer and our invitation, bowing your heads and being in an attitude of prayer. Our music is playing in the background. Why don't you bow your heads? Let me pray with you. And maybe you can make this a time of sweet interaction and communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for an accounting that happened 2,000 years ago that happened in the life of Pharisees, disciples, people that needed healing, your disciples that had to learn and grow. And yet today we can grab it and go, wow, that hits me. I pray you'd work on our hearts in our time of invitation. In Jesus' name.